Welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. I'm your host, Kerry Muelstein, and this is a podcast where we just talk about uh, things that have made the Scriptures come to life for us, times when the Scriptures have become real, uh, with the idea that when they are more real, uh, they apply to our lives better, we love them more, we can, uh, in times of struggle or challenge, remember, hey, I know that these are real, and, and turn to them again and draw power out of them. So, uh, Plus, it's just good fun to talk about uh, things that have helped the scriptures become more powerful and real for us. So my guest today is a friend I've had for a long time. I, I You'll have to correct me, Rebecca, if I am wrong on this, but I, I think I first met Rebecca when she was a student in Jerusalem back in 2010, I think. Um, does that That's seem correct. right? Yes. So uh, she was she was studying in Jerusalem, and I was uh, teaching at the Jerusalem Center, and we've been friends ever since. She uh, became friends with my family. We were enthralled by her beautiful singing and by her teaching. Uh, I, I still remember, I think, the first time I met you, you were teaching gospel doctrine class in the Jerusalem Center, and in the audience was uh, Kent Jackson, Kent Brown, Jeff Chadwick, myself, Frank Judd. So she had like five or six religion teachers in the audience, and I thought that must be intimidating. And she just stood up and taught the most amazing lesson. Uh, and uh, I knew we had someone that was worth uh, getting to know right then. Uh, Rebecca is a graduate student uh, right now, just working on her dissertation. I'll let her tell you a little bit more about that and about herself. So welcome, Rebecca, and, and tell us uh, just a little bit about yourself. Thank you. It's it's great to be here. Uh, I am a PhD candidate um, working on my dissertation at Claremont Graduate University in Southern California. Uh, my main area of emphasis is the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the Hebrew Bible essentially is what we would call the Old Testament, um, but studying in Hebrew. So there are a few, the, the order of the books are different and things. Yeah. Uh, but but largely, if, if I say Hebrew Bible, you can translate that to mean Old Testament. Uh, and my main, my, my dissertation, I am writing on um, the phrase in Genesis chapter 2, eight, verse 18, when it says, so God has just created the human. He said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Let us make help meet. And I am focusing on that phrase, help meet, uh, which in Hebrew is ezer connecto. And it's interesting because this phrase has been used as a touchstone uh, by a lot of people in many different religious traditions as kind of this uh, foundation for understanding gender roles. Uh, and so I was shocked when I discovered that there have been no significant scholarly works written on this phrase and that people make a lot of uh, interpretations based on this phrase without really looking at what these words are doing together and what these words mean in the wider context of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and so that's what I'm doing. I, I am doing a very, very deep study in the Hebrew Bible on this phrase. Uh, now, that's that's exciting stuff. That's really exciting stuff. I uh, so I, I'm not really a professional podcast guy. I'm I'm just a teacher that likes to talk with his friends. So I probably should have said stuff about uh, you know liking and sharing and stuff. But I don't even know what that means yet. So I haven't said that. But what? But I do know teasers. So what I would like to do is give a teaser and say like uh, when you are getting closer and further along in your dissertation. Although I'm sure you have plenty you'd like to say right now. But but uh, we should get together and do another podcast where you can talk about that phrase. It's one that. Uh, I find when I talk about it in my classes, all of my students, but especially my female students, uh, really resonate with trying to to get a, a realistic understanding of that phrase rather than some of the ways it's been used over time. So that's a teaser to keep coming back to the podcast so you can see when Rebecca comes back. I'm um, so happy to talk about Ezra Connecto. <laughs> yeah, good. Let's see if you still are in a few months. There, there gets to be a point where you are tired of talking about your dissertation. You're just sick of your dissertation. You just want your dissertation to be done and go away. But we'll try and catch you before you get to that point. So anyway, <laughs> well, Rebecca, why don't you tell us about some times that the scriptures have become real to you, just that when an, a, an insight came to you or an experience or something along those lines, and the scriptures just became more real. Okay. Uh, the first one that comes to mind actually was the first time that I visited the Holy Land. And I went up to Galilee and to the, there's this mountain that overlooks. So on the southwestern coast of the Sea of Galilee, there's a, there's a city called Tiberias. And there's a mountain just outside of Tiberias called Mount Arbel. Yeah, I love and, Mount Arbel. Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah. And I had this experience. We, you, you drive up, it's kind of a 
a national park area, and then you can hike. It's maybe a 10 or 15 minute hike to the top of the mountain. And of course, as I'm there, I'm thinking, well, you know, Jesus was in this area. And as we're hiking up, I looked off kind of to the west. So not we couldn't quite see the Sea of Galilee yet. And there were these cliffs with a whole bunch of caves in them. And I just thought about, you know, the the man who was possessed and had a, had you know was had evil spirits and had been hiding in the caves and nobody could bind him with chains and all of a sudden the geography the topography of the land became real in a way i had never experienced before uh, because i could imagine him living in caves and jesus walking along and coming and it was it rough terrain and 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 that was the first experience on this hike up mount arbel when we got up to the top, when you get up to Mount Arbel, it almost looks like this kind of plain. And you can walk over and look out over the Sea of Galilee. It's gorgeous. You can see all the way to the other coast. And and there's kind of all these flattish rocks all along the top of Arbel. Mm. And yeah. I just had this picture in my mind of Christ teaching like the Sermon on the Mount or feeding the 5,000 and sitting up there and people sitting on these rocks that are already kind of flat like chairs and, and him teaching and just being surrounded by people who are soaking up what the savior had to teach. And, and I was there, it was June at this time. So it was already quite hot and pretty Brown and it, but it just totally changed my visualization of when I read the scriptures and it gave me a picture of, what it might've looked like when Christ was there. So that I would say was the first thing was learning about and experiencing the geography of the Holy land. Uh, there's something so powerful. In fact, I'm, I'm really passionate about this of helping people either through pictures or, I mean, going there is ideal, but, uh, but through pictures or maps or whatever, when, when you can picture a story in your mind, just visually, I, it, it, just reaches you on a different level. So I, I, I know the exact experiences you're talking about. Yeah. And, and I have to say going forward, Mount Arbel is one of my favorite places in the oh. Holy land. It's, I'm it's gorgeous. Well, good. Um, I would say the second thing that I would like to talk about is mostly specific to the Hebrew Bible, but not entirely. Um, my first semester as an undergraduate at Brigham Young University, I took an Old Testament class from Don Perry. And it was an incredible experience. And one of the one of the assignments that we needed to do, and we talked a lot about, were rhetorical devices or poetic parallelisms in the Hebrew Bible text. And our big assignment for the class is that we had to go through and find two examples of each of the different types of rhetorical devices. So for example, you have things like what they would call um, just regular uh, harmonic parallelisms, where especially in books like Isaiah, um, you open it up and you'll say something like, hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, where you have two lines that are essentially saying something that's relatively synonymous. They're both having something that's saying, listen, and then it's giving the idea that everything, the heavens and the earth should be listening. So the, Isaiah could have just as easily said, everybody listen up, right? But part of the poetic structure of Hebrew is that they they pair things, um, usually in twos, sometimes in, in fours or other numbers. And so you can have uh, parallels that reflect each other or parallels that are an, uh, antonyms to each other. So for example, and I'm making this up, uh, the wise will be joyful, but the, the foolish will sorrow. You know, so you have wise right. and foolish, joy and sorrow. And so, and, and there are a whole bunch of these. And But learning about them, all of a sudden, scriptures started making sense. Like they just yeah. became vibrant. And especially some of the, I'm going to put this in quotations, harder books, things like mm -hmm. Isaiah that a lot of times we become scared of because it's such a different writing style. And I started realizing no, that this one verse really has one idea. It's just restated two or three times. And, and it started making sense. And there was this moment, this one day, I remember I was reading and I'd been reading the Old Testament and I was kind of doing a word chain. So I was going through the different books. 
And I was reading in the New Testament and there were some poetic parallelisms. And then it, the, the Book of Mormon has a ton of poetic parallelisms. And then I remember yes. reading, and this was the day that kind of blew my mind. I was reading in the Doctrine and Covenants. And I don't even remember the verse I was reading, but it was in Hebrew poetic parallel form. And I couldn't believe it because it makes sense for the Hebrew Bible, which was written in Hebrew and that's how they write poetry. Yes. Or the new Testament, which is carrying on the Jewish tradition. You expect to find it or the book of Mormon. I mean, Nephi comes from Jerusalem. You're going to expect them to speak in this way. But I would say, if you want to call it the most distant scripture from a Hebrew language being the doctrine and covenants <laughs> and also finding Hebrew poetic parallelism form there, just blew my mind. And I just felt like all of the scriptures came to life and they made sense in a way they had never made sense before. Uh, wonderful. I, I agree so much. I, uh, in fact, I had a somewhat similar experience myself where uh, I also studied uh, Hebrew poetry with Donald Perry. And, um, and I, I, so I spent some time uh, and probably he'd already done this or someone had already done this. And I wasn't smart enough to just look at what they'd done, but I, I was spending some time going through Isaiah and trying to like, kind of, lay it out, write it out on a notepad in in a format where you could see the parallelism just as a practice for myself to get better at it. And then I found that uh, that Don Perry had uh, this little booklet where he'd done the same thing with the Book of Mormon. And when I looked at the Book of Mormon, that it looked the same way that my little notepad with Isaiah looked like, oh, wow, the Book of Mormon is as full of Hebrew poetry as Isaiah is. And Isaiah is like more full of Hebrew poetry than anything. But the Book of Mormon is every bit that, that way, and it matches perfectly. I already knew the Book of Mormon was true. I already appreciated the Book of Mormon. It was already real to me. But it became that way again mm -hmm. to think there's no way uh, Joseph Smith uh, made up Hebrew poetry that well. Uh, and and it, it just kind of hit me what a beautiful and well-crafted book that was. And in both cases, for both Isaiah and Mormon or Nephi, in this case, I was reading Nephi, so it was Nephi. I could sit there and picture them uh, in the same way that I was trying to uh, figure out what their parallels were and, and sitting in my little spot writing these things down. I could picture them sitting there trying to say, okay, I, I want to say this this way, but how? What? What's the you know? What, what's the right word to be synonymous with that one? Or uh, that doesn't quite work out. And I could suddenly picture them crafting their message so carefully, and and not only did they become more real to me, but I had a greater appreciation for the work they went through to make this speak more powerfully to us. I'm so grateful for those prophets. Yeah, yeah, and I remember uh, just building on that, especially as you were talking about Joseph Smith. Uh, I remember in my master's degree, which was not at Brigham Young University, and when they talked about the, you know, the Hebrew literary devices, and I went and read an article on it and realized that the scholarly world never even discovered that these existed. They never identified them. I'm wanting to say it was in the 1880s. I think that's right. anyone noticed that there were these sorts of patterns in the text, which I think says something about the Book of Mormon and, you know, Joseph Smith couldn't have just gone and picked up the Anchor Bible Dictionary and said, oh, well, you know, I should write something that has all of these in it, right? Yeah. He, he yeah. couldn't because they didn't know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's too carefully crafted in a culture foreign to his to be coincidence. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, because you don't find that. You can read our great poets, and you can read when great poets write prose in English, and it does not exhibit these forms. It's, it's completely different. Um, but I agree with you also that when you start to recognize them in the scriptures, it just makes things make more sense, right? And your example is perfect, right? Um, if we just say, you know, hear, O heavens, then you say, okay, good. He, he wants everyone to hear. But recognizing that the next line is a way of fleshing out his concept more, of, of adding more nuance, right? Uh, then, then when you read a, a Give Hero Earth, it, it, it adds meaning to it. Or, or for example, you'll find um, righteousness and peace used in parallel with each other by Isaiah. And you suddenly realize, oh, Isaiah is equating righteousness and peace. There's there's a concept there that's worth my exploring. What What is the relationship between righteousness and peace that Isaiah sees? Uh, how, how would that apply to my life? So recognizing how these flesh things out uh, really opens up another level of the scriptures. Yeah, it really does. And, and it's amazing. Yeah. 
good, clean fun, isn't it? Yes. Lasts all day. Yeah, that's right. There you go. Good. <laughs> Never going to run out. That's right. All right. Um, okay. The next one that I would like to talk about is the idea. So this started um, with a word study that I was doing during my master's degree on the Hebrew word chesed, which mm. is frequently translated in English as loving kindness, sometimes as mercy or compassion, uh, among other things. And I started looking at chesed and it's really chesed almost always occurs in the Hebrew Bible in context of covenants. So it's a covenant lover, either for example, this is between a husband and wife, like Abraham and Sarah, or when there's about to be a covenant established, for example, um, with David and Jonathan, when Saul is really decided he's coming after David's life and Jonathan realizes this and Jonathan supposedly would be next in line for the throne. But Jonathan, because of his chesed for David, makes a covenant that he will support David. Um, So chesed is a particular type of covenant love. And so as I was studying this, I started looking into more into covenants in the ancient Near East. And there is a particular type of covenant. It's called the Lord Vassal Covenant that I think really becomes significant for how we understand our covenant relationship to God. Um, So in the ancient Near East, you had many, many kingdoms, if you want to say. You would have a small kingdom that could be just one city, really. And there would be a king of the city, and then the neighboring cities would all have their own kings. Or maybe it was a little bit larger, and it would be a king, and they'd be over five or six cities or or more. And and so you'd have everyone uh, arranged from these small kings and small kingdoms up to these massive empires like for example the assyrian empire um who had hundreds of thousands of soldiers at their immediate call and and covered just huge huge areas of land now what the lord vassal covenant became important because it was very common for these smaller kings to go to war against each other to try to increase their kingdom um this became problematic when you're a small, you know, you're small fry and the big guys are starting to come after you. Yeah. What you can do is you make, you make a covenant with the big, the emperor, you know, the King Sargon or something of Assyria. And what happens is you make this covenant and the Lord sets the terms of the covenant. And pretty much it's generally something to the idea that you each year you will give this percentage of all your increase and you'll give a certain number of fighting men to come join my army And in return, I will protect you, meaning you have the force of my armies to protect you and your little tiny kingdom. So, and also I don't destroy you. Right, and also I don't destroy. That is also very key. Yeah. (laughs) And so, then instead of having your little tiny fighting force of five hundred men to to protect your area, when you know Pharaoh comes up from Egypt and starts running over your land, suddenly you have an army of three hundred thousand people at your back. Yeah, And so it totally changes the game. And when I started thinking of this, um, that we are in essentially a Lord vassal covenant with God, um, where he's the Lord, he sets the terms, he has certain tributes, so to speak, that he asks of us. Right. And in return, we have his entire army behind us. He's the Lord of hosts. We have all of his protective power behind us suddenly covenants become a much more important thing. It's not just, oh, yeah, well, God asked me to be baptized, and, you know, so I'll do this thing, and that's the end of it. No, there are things we must do, and we reap, by far, the much larger benefit out of this situation. Uh, And and I'm going to tie it back into covenant love, um, because I think that, We are bound to God by covenant love because God's not just the king of Assyria who, you know, after three generations, it starts falling and the Babylonians take over and the covenant is broken. And, you know, he's not in it for the money. God's in this because he loves us. He loves us to the point that he sent that Christ came. And as it says in Hebrews 7, I'm wanting to say that he was the high priest and the sacrifice, that he sacrificed himself to create this covenant. Um, and, and that's another important element of Lord Vassal covenants is that usually they would take animals and 
cut them down the center and walk between the pieces. So you'd have this sacrifice that solemnized the covenant. And many times when they made these covenants, they would have what they would call the, the maledictory oath, which would mean if either party breaks the covenant, then let it be for that party, just as what has happened to this animal that we've cut or broken or burnt or Burned. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That, that if King Sennacherib of Assyria breaks his covenant, may he be burnt just like this, this bull or, or something. And I think when we apply that to Christ, Christ being called the covenant, um, that essentially we could say that there is a maledictory oath here that for either side who breaks the covenant, they will be like Christ who died. Right. That makes it very significant when Christ uh, rises again. And because Christ can't die, that means he cannot break the covenant because it is impossible for the, the, the curse that is associated with the covenant to be applied to Christ. Therefore he cannot break it unless he ceases to be God because he would then cease Good. to exist. Good. On top of that, for those who break the covenant, the bad things happen. For those who keep the covenant, the good things happen. What is the good thing that happened to Christ? He was resurrected. Uh, Therefore, for all of us who choose to keep the covenant, we also must be resurrected because that's part of the covenant relationship. And I would, I would propose that this is a covenant that we made before we ever came to earth. Uh, good. That, the, yeah. that the token of this covenant is our physical bodies. That we received that token and therefore all of us who kept the who made that covenant can be resurrected because Christ was resurrected. We have to be resurrected because we're in this covenant relationship. Oh, that's fantastic stuff. There's so much to explore there. Um, I, I, let, let's go through a couple of those and hopefully I remember all the different parts I want to explore. Sorry, with you, I but, think I kind uh, of downloaded there. <laughs> no, no, that's perfect. And it's beautiful. And, and people, if they, didn't listen to any of the rest of the stuff we said, we'd still just be beautifully blessed by what you've just talked about. But I'm just thinking, let's explore, first of all, that uh, idea that you've got, uh, as it were, this this someone who will protect you, right? The, this Lord, and you're the vassal. The vassal clearly is is the uh, the underling here, right? So covenants were always about establishing relationships, and it was never an equal relationship. Now, that to me is the astounding thing about the covenant with God, because in the end, the end blessing of the covenant is that we can become godlike. Right? We're in a, a, a relationship with someone who is so much more powerful than us. But rather than like every other covenant, where the the interest of the, the point of the covenant for that Lord is that He maintains that that relation. He wants to be higher than His vassal, and He will take from the vassal, use the vassal, whatever way to make sure that He stays higher than that vessel and all the other vassals. Whereas we're in a covenant with the being who is so much higher than us, and yet what he's trying to do is get us to his level. That's mm-hmm. that's astounding, and and that's because of his chesed, right? His his yeah. love, and that's the that's the element that is different in this covenant with God than the, say a covenant between Judah and Assyria. The right. king of Assyria did not have chesed for the king of Judah, right? There wasn't that covenant of love and loyalty and willingness to be to extend mercy and so on. Um, it, 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 that, that was not part of the covenant, but that is part of the covenant between, uh, us and, and, uh, God. And, um, and so I'm wondering, and, and maybe you won't have any further ideas, but if you, if, if you, that gives you some ideas, you'd like to explore a little bit with, and also with the idea that, um, this relationship that you just described where you'll have someone like the King of Assyria who has dozens of Kings. And he talks about how he's conquered dozens of Kings and, and it's easy for him to conquer Kings. That's where the phrase King of Kings comes from, right? He is the King over all of these other Kings. And then, uh, Isaiah and others take that, that phrase that the Israelites would have understood and applies it to God as the real King of Kings. But who are the other Kings that he's talking about? Right. And, and, uh, uh, or Queens or whatever, however we'd like to phrase that. Uh, and how does that relate to that chesed and our, our imbalance in our, our covenantal relationship with them, but it's an imbalance that's good for us. We don't want, you know, and anyway, so I don't know if you have more further thoughts on that. I do have a couple thoughts actually. Um, so it's interesting that in, so in the chesed relationship, the person who gives chesed is always the person who is in that situation more powerful, right? So in the case of God and us, it's always God to us. Or in the case of, um, 
for example, when the, when the Israelites went and they wanted to invade Jericho and they go and they meet Rahab and she helps them out. She gets them out of the city. She showed, you know, because of Rahab, they're able to get out safely. Right. And, and Rahab says, when you attack Jericho, show me Chesed. And they do because she knows at that point, she knows they're going to win and please spare me and my family. And they do right. because they're, they're the more powerful in that position. And so it's interesting that there are a few places, usually when Chesed occurs in the relationship between God and humans, it is God to humans. But there are a couple times when it says, you know, uh, for example, in Jeremiah, God says, I remember when you were following me in the wilderness and you're Chesed to me. Uh, and so it implies that people can do Chesed to God. And so I started doing a, a word search and there are several times in the text when God explicitly says to the people, to the, the people of Israel, give Chesed to the people outside of the covenant, extend right. Chesed to others. And, and here's where I'm going to tie it back into what you're saying. God's covenant relationship, the way that God is God, King of Kings, is that he extends Hesed to those of us who are so much lower than him. Right. And the way that he wants us to give Hesed back to him is to extend that same covenant love to the other people who are outside of our covenant. So to essentially do the same thing to them that God's already doing to us. So behave to all your little vassal. It sounds horrible in modern day speech. Low, lower stat, or, or, or lower status than you kind of people. Right. The people right? who yeah. aren't as well off as you extend to them the same generosity and loving kindness that I'm giving to you. You do it to them. Yeah. And I think that's the only way because we're never going to be situationally more powerful than God. Right. He's omnipotent. So the only way that we can even potentially return Hesed to God is by paying it forward, by giving it to other people. Yeah, it's beautiful. And, and in a way, he's as he asks us to extend Chesed to others, he's asking us to invite them into a relationship with us that is, mirrors the relationship we have with him, which reminds me, for example, of the intercessory prayer, right? Where Christ says, okay, I'm, I'm one with God, and I want to be one with you. And then you'll be one with God. And then I want you to get others and, and they'll be one. And we just all end up being one because as we spread, as we pay it forward, you say, right? It's this chesed uh, forwarded, chesed it forward. Maybe that should be our new yeah, phrase. I right? like it. <laughs> yeah. So good, good. I was also really um, impressed uh, as you were talking with a, a couple of other notions. Um, uh, so remind me, we want to come back and talk about sacrifice and covenant. Mm -hmm. But before I forget this one, uh, the... Uh, the symbolism of, like you said, the malediction that comes when you when you don't keep the covenant, right? And and so covenant was always entered into by sacrifice, and we'll talk about that. But that sacrifice usually had with it some kind of ritual that was uh, it kind of destructive in nature, right? You kill the animal, you burn the fat, you burn the clothes. That's that actually in, in the Book of Mormon, we get you tearing the clothes. We get tearing clothes in Hittite uh, rituals and so on. Uh, and as you said, it, it tells uh, you say, well, well, this bad thing will happen to you or the person agreeing to, to, says to me if I break the terms of the covenant. And then you tied that into our relationship with Christ. I had a, a, a great friend and colleague named Terry Zink who once pointed this out to me, just I, I think a, a great insight. He said, really, the sacrament becomes that we, we as we partake of the sacrament, this is broken bread. Right. Uh, and it symbolizes and, and, and water that symbolizes Christ sacrificing himself, his body breaking and and uh, his spilling his blood. And I don't really I mean, I, I certainly get the and always had gotten the idea of that, that. Then I take that upon me. I take his power and then his overcoming death like you talked about. Um, but he tied it into Section 19, where Christ says, if you don't repent, then you must suffer even as I. And in a way that is saying. Okay, if you don't if if you don't keep the covenant that you're renewing here at the sacrament table, then this suffering that you're commemorating that I went through, it's going to be your suffering. You you don't escape the suffering if you don't keep these covenants. But if you do keep the covenants, then all of this uh, symbolism here passes you by. I I I did that for you, and and that ties into all the things you were talking about. With then we'll be resurrected and we overcome because He did right, and and He's God. It's it's inevitable if we just keep our 
our part. So I don't that 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 really touched me. I don't know if you have further thoughts. I I, I just sprung this on you, but uh, but uh, it it's meaningful to me. Yeah, um, I don't know that I have further to add. I but yeah. I must say I had never connected section nineteen as essentially being the maledictory oath, which is that's really beautiful. Yeah. So thank yeah, you when, for pointing that out. Well, it was Terry Zink who pointed it out to me, and I've I've never forgotten it. It just really was stark to me. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting. Uh, so uh, you and I, I think, would have talked about this anyway. And just to let uh, maybe some other folks in on on uh, something. So uh, I, I, I'm also a big fan of Chesed and understanding Chesed and its uh, uh, how it works in covenant. And and I've written about that in in my book on the covenant, which Rebecca was the one. For any book I write, I want to make sure someone else who really knows this stuff. Uh, has some eyes on it so they can tell me, oh, you kind of got this wrong here. Or did you think about this? And Rebecca was the one that that did that for that book for me. And I'm very grateful. The book is much, much better because of uh, Rebecca's uh, input there. I think you shaped that book uh, more than anyone except myself. So, um, but uh, uh, so we're, we're like uh, Chesed uh, stu- uh, study mates uh, as it were. And, and we're really into this. And we've talked about uh, sacrifice when we were uh, having dialogue about that book. Um, but, Coincidentally, just this morning in our, my family's Come Follow Me reading, our, our family scripture study, we were reading in section 97, and I'm just going to read that verse, uh, and uh, in section 97, verse 8, where it says, Verily I say unto you, uh, all among them who know their hearts are bro- or sorry, their hearts are honest and are broken, and their spirits contrite, and are willing to observe their covenants by sacrifice, yea, every sacrifice which I, the Lord, shall command. They are accepted of me, right? And we've already talked about how covenant, you enter into it by sacrifice, whether that's the baptism covenant, in which case you're supposed to sacrifice the old you, it's buried in the water and you rise up a new you, right? You're getting, you're sacrificing yourself as it were, but, uh, or whether this is a, a covenant like with the Assyrians that we talked about, or a covenant made at the altar of the tabernacle and you sacrifice there, there's always a sacrifice. Um, and I find it, it's interesting when we talk about covenants the way you were, we make a sacrifice, which at times can be a great sacrifice, right? It can be an Abrahamic sacrifice. Mm-hmm. It can be great in terms of how, uh, what we have the uh, ability to sacrifice. And by doing that, we are able to partake of Christ's sacrifice. And that, this ties back into your idea that we tie into someone who's a lot more powerful than us and that can fight some battles that there's no way we can fight ourselves. Um, but the only way for us to really access Christ's supernal and, and uh, transcendent and eternal sacrifice is by our sacrificing, our, our small and our big, big for us, but small in comparison to Christ, right? Uh, our sacrifices, that, that, that you have to give sacrifice to accept sacrifice, which I think is uh, really, in a, in a way, symbolized at the altar of the tabernacle, for instance, because you make the sacrifice. But the symbolism of the sacrifice in the end is really about Christ. Um, it's, but it's about you too, right? They're both. And, and so I, I find that whole idea of um, sacrificing as part of covenant in both ancient times and modern times to be, uh, that's something that, again, makes the scriptures more real for me because I do have sacrifices in my life. And I know people who have a lot bigger sacrifices than I make. And I know you've got had lots of thoughts about sacrifices and, and, and so on with covenant. I don't know if you have, uh, you already shared a bunch with us, but I don't know what, what you think about uh, those ideas I just threw out there. If it's just me being crazy or, or what your thoughts are. But. No, those are great thoughts already. Um, and I just love how you're pointing out that really our sacrifice in a sense is a mirror, a, a small mirror um, yeah. in a sense, kind of a through the glass darkly kind of mirror, because it can in no way be a really accurate reflection of Christ's sacrifice. Um but it kind of makes me think about, stay with me here, because it's, right. it's kind of a thought yeah. that occurred to me that maybe needs a little developing. That's that's what we're here for, to explore together in front of uh, no one and yet a, a few other people can listen in. Great. Uh, it, it makes me think about a lot of the writings, like especially in John 17, uh, when Christ is essentially saying his relationship with the Father and how he wants his relationship with us to be. Right. Uh, where Christ is saying, you know, I am one with the Father. And and even if we go to Third Nephi, Christ arrives in, and he meets with the Nephites and he says, I'm going to teach you my doctrine. And when I first read that, I was like, okay, great. 
And then there's like four or five verses where he talks about this other stuff. And then finally he talks about baptism. And I was like, oh, his doctrine is baptism. I don't know what those other three verses are doing there, but it's baptism. Well, I went back and was rereading it. And and he says, this is my doctrine. I'm going to paraphrase now. I am one with the Father and the Father is one with me. And you are one in me and the Father. And we're all one. The Holy Ghost is one with us. And be baptized. So he's talking about this idea of unity. And then he talks about covenant. Right. And and so I think that this idea of sacrifice that we have to give up whatever it is that's keeping us from unity with other people in mm-hmm. order to be one with them. And, and I'm not saying that unity means lack of diversity. I think unity means being one in the Holy Ghost because if we're one in the Holy Ghost, our diversity doesn't actually go away, but it doesn't become a cause for conflict. Good. It becomes a cause for pro- progression. And... And so I think there's this idea that Christ sacrificed everything so that he could be one with the father because he's doing his father's will and be one with us. It's, it's all about creating this oneness, this unity, not just between individuals, but for the entire human race that we can all be one. And it only yeah. happens when, we're, when we sacrifice and we honor Christ's sacrifice. We essentially buy into it. We, like we, Right. Not only by partake. It, we we partake, we abide in it. We're yeah. living in oh, this, good. we're immersed in this. Yes. And that's the only way that we can overcome our fallen nature, which is to be divisive. Yeah, and contentious. And contentious. So yeah. so yes, I think that sacrifice also has this connection with oneness and unity. Uh I agree. I agree. And in fact, uh, so you'll get we'll, the two of us will get going and we'll never stop. But um, it, it, I, I'm I'm so happy and impressed that you kind of saw that in the the doctrine of Christ. As, as I've looked at it, and it seems to me like we miss it most of the time. But if you look at the key places where you know Second Nephi thirty one and thirty two, Third Nephi eleven, Third Nephi twenty seven, there are a couple of other little places where you get it. But if you look in those when when they talk about the doctrine or the gospel of Christ, uh, each time there is an element in there where Christ and he he typically leads with it. About the unity of the Godhead, he includes himself, the, the the Father, and the Holy Ghost, and we usually skip over it to get to the baptism repentance part. Right. And it seems to me he's he's leading with it. That's actually the core element of it, and everything else is about how that is established and how he's inviting us into that. And you're right; it's through sacrifice, his and ours, like we talked about. So, ah, that's just it's beautiful, exciting stuff. So, ah, good stuff, good clean fun. Well, great. Um, I, I think that uh, you mentioned you may have had some other topics that uh, times that the scriptures became real for you. Yes, I do. Um, you know, just since we're talking about love, just one brief something that I think can tie in with this whole covenant love. Um, <clears throat> I've been thinking about love and, and it's interesting when you read about charity, almost always, Charity brings some sort of awareness. Charity is tied with awareness. So, for example, in 1 Corinthians, when it talks about, you know, charity is the greatest of all, and, you know, faith, hope, charity, and the greatest of these is charity. Immediately after, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. You go to Moroni, chapter 7, verses 45 through 48, and it outlines what charity is. Right. And then you get to the end, those who pray with all the energy of heart, that they may be filled with this love, that they may be the sons of God, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Right. Um, at beginning of Moroni, oh, in addition, beginning of Moroni 7, the whole introduction to charity, Moroni says, I'm going to show you the way to judge, meaning how do you perceive good and bad? How do you see? How do so? Charity is very much tied with this idea of understanding. Um, And I think the way that we get that understanding is through the hard kind of love. Like when we read, like charity, I think is never, yeah, I think charity is not an easy kind of love. It's the hard kind of love. Uh, Because when we read, what is charity? Charity suffers long. That implies it's hard. There's suffering happening. Charity suffers long. And is kind when there's reason to be unkind Hmm. and is not puffed up. Even when there's justification, you know, you're better at something than someone else seeketh not her own. Like all of these, like thinks no evil, even when maybe there's reason that you could think badly of someone, like everything that charity is, 
It's when there's good reason to not be that. So it's the hard kind of love when somebody, yes, has has offended you or been outright rude or done something to hurt you. And I think the love of the atonement is charity. That is innately what charity is. When it says charity is the greatest of all, it's because this atoning love is the greatest of all. Because everything else fails, but the atonement never fails. You can be the most patient person in the world, but without the atonement, it doesn't do anything for you. So, and the atonement, I think, is the prime example of the hard kind of love. Because none of us really are deserving of saving. None of us deserve the kind of unconditional love that the Savior gives us. We're we're hard to work with. When, when you're a perfect being and you're working with these people who can seem like they never manage to see beyond themselves, and, and I'm yeah. being a little bit hyperbolic here, I can see that it would be very difficult for Christ to say, I'm giving this anyway, yeah. because this or, is or to I suffer, people. Right. Or to, or to suffer something that is uh, uh, like, I've done things where I knew this was wrong and I did it anyway. Mm-hmm. And that's the hardest part for me, like to forgive someone like, well, you knew that that was going to cause me this pain. You knew that was going to do it and you did it anyway. And uh, but for Christ to say, well, yeah, he knew this was wrong. He knew this would cause me pain. He knew this would cause other people. I will suffer this anyway. That, in fact, as I listen to your description, uh, you know, and the suffering long and I puffed up and so on, think it's no evil. Uh, it's the antithesis of our natural response or the natural man, fallen man or whatever. It's the exact opposite of it. And of course we can only come overcome that through the, the atoning sacrifice of Christ. So that, that's just beautifully said, beautifully mm-hmm. said. And it ties in again with the, with the doctrine of Christ we were talking about. So it, interestingly to me, if we go through those times where the doctrine of Christ is outlined, it kind of always ends on something about the Holy ghost. So in 2 Nephi 31, it's the Holy Ghost will show you everything you should do. Um, in 3 Nephi 11, it's that the Holy Ghost bears witness of the Father and the Son and, and so on. In 3 Nephi 27, it's that the Holy Ghost sanctifies. Um, you get this little mini, and it follows right after the charity discussion. So it's in Moroni 8, so I mean not right after, but a little while after. Um, towards the end of Moroni 8, there's a little mini kind of version of the doctrine of Christ given real quickly. And in that one, the focus of the Holy Ghost is that it fills you with charity. Hmm. Uh, and, and so, uh, it, 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 it's just kind of tying together all those things Mormon had just been talking about. Uh, but he brings that in as this is, you know, so in the doctrine of Christ, we need the Holy ghost for any number of reasons, but one of them is because when the atoning sacrifice of Christ really does sanctify us, when it changes us, then what happens? We, we love, or we have chesed like Christ does, right? Yeah. Well, wow, this whole discussion ties together. You, you're brilliant the way you've done this. Brilliant. I, I wish I could say I'd planned it out, but I really haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just no. the gospel's the gospel. It happens naturally. It so, is. Yeah. And you know what you're saying about how, I'm just going to jump back onto what you're saying about Moroni 8, where it says the Holy Ghost fills us with charity. Um, I was reading in Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis is brilliant, and his discussion on the Godhead. I don't necessarily agree with everything he has to say because he was, defending the idea of the the Trinity and and that's fine. But he had this statement about the Holy ghost. So he, uh, he said something to the effect that the Holy ghost is the great connector. Mm. And I started thinking about that, that the Holy ghost, the Holy ghost is one with God and Christ. And as the Holy ghost brings us charity, it ties us together. And when we enter into the body of Christ, when we're baptized, we come into the full of God. We need the Holy ghost. Why? Mm. Because we are meant to be connected with other people. So right. when we're just, I can't stop thinking about sister so-and-so, I just should give her a call. That's that Holy Ghost connection because we're meant to be connected with mm. others. That's and so, so the Holy Ghost brings charity because when we are learning to be one, when we're learning to be connected with others, we also learn to see or perceive others in the way that Christ does, which is full of mercy and grace and love, and that also eliminates contention and strife. Huh. It's beautiful stuff. Yeah, that's it beautiful. Is. Charity is a very beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, and 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 being one with Christ and each other. Uh, 
just ah, what what more could we ask for, right? Yeah. Well, good. Uh, any any parting thoughts? Anything else you'd like to say or talk about, or good jokes it would be fine too. Goodness. Um. Okay. Can we have one more thing? Do we have time for? Oh yeah. One more. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um. Maybe two, because I think they kind okay. of tie together. Sounds good. So I think the, kind of talking about faith and works, um, mm. there's going to be two experiences that really kind of made this make sense, come to life for me. Uh, the first was a few years ago. This was, I don't know, two, maybe two years ago, two and a half years ago. And I realized one day that, I felt like deep in my core, I would never be enough. And I was like, this is why I'm I'm Mm. kind of an overachiever, always wanting the highest grades and kind of perfectionist. It was because on a very deep level, I was like, I I, I have to try to be enough. And no matter what I do, it's never enough. And so I was praying and had this very interesting conversation, if you will, where I said, you know, I just feel like I'm never going to be enough. And the response was, you're right. You're not, you're not enough. So stop trying because it's not your job to be enough. You never will be enough, but Christ is enough. So rather than trying to be enough, why don't you just go try to be with Christ? And it was kind of this, whoa, wake up call. I'm so fixated on my own insufficiency, which is inherent because I'm human and I make mistakes that I wasn't even bothering to focus on the thing that really counts. Um, And now fast forward a couple years, this is this last January. And, and here's where I'm going to kind of transition into what does it mean for faith and works uh, for me, kind of what I figured out. Um, And I do Shotokai karate and we've been doing virtual practices and, and usually we, we have these upper level black belts who had been leading the virtual practices and um, the president of our organization had, had said, you know, we'd really like to train some of the lower, you know, I'm a, I'm a first degree black belt. And he said, we'd like to train and help them teach. And so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of do, you know, I will work with one person for about six weeks and every other practice, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll choose a theme and every other practice for six weeks, we'll teach on that theme and, and, he would teach the Saturday practice and I would teach the Tuesday practice or something like that. And so we started doing this and, and this is my first time really doing a lot of teaching in karate. And, and it was a little bit intimidating because I'm teaching people who have decades of experience on me as right. well as other people who, you know, only been doing this like a year or something, you know, it was just kind of anybody who came and I would be teaching that class session. And it was interesting because it, it was um, first I had to allow myself, I had to give myself permission to, to fail. And, and when that, and once I gave myself permission to fail, um, I could get a little more creative with creating my exercises. And it was interesting. There was one week that I went through and I planned all these exercises and I was like, yeah, I think these are going to be good. We went and we had practice and it flopped. It flopped yeah. really, really badly. And I, just, I know this all sound, I, I promise I'm going to bring this around. Okay. No, no, um, we're good. So it, it flopped really badly and I went back and I, what did I do wrong? I went back through my exercises. They were good exercises. Even after doing them, I was like, no, they, they were all teaching to the point I was trying to make. I don't know what went wrong. And I talked with the, you know, the, my mentor teacher and, and he gave me some feedback about who I was being as a teacher. But it wasn't actually the problem with the exercises. It was who I was being as a teacher. So the next week, I, I really wanted to take this on, and I decided, okay, I need to be teacherly, okay, uh, and, and, and change who I'm being as I'm teaching. And I went through, and I made some exercises, and we did it, and it was an incredible practice. And I got to the end of the practice, and I was once again puzzled, because not all of my exercises that week were actually that good. Like, there were some I would never do again, you know? Mm. Yeah. But the practice had worked and I could see that people were learning and they were excited and it flowed. And I kind of had this epiphany and this is where it kind of comes into faith and works. When I'm teaching karate, the exercisers are not actually what's important. What we do, what we don't do, whether or not it's a 
great structure of practice has nothing to do with the quality of the practice itself and whether or not people learn. It has everything to do with who I'm being as a teacher. Mm. And so when we're being disciples of Christ, the, the individual things don't matter. Did I remember to read my scriptures or not this morning? It doesn't actually matter. What matters is, am I be- being disciply? Because if I'm being disciply, new word, <laughs> all the other things are going to follow. Just like when I'm being teacherly, the exercises, imperfect though they are, are going to follow and everybody's going to learn. So when I'm being disciply, the prayers, the scripture stuff, it's, I may not have a giant list. Oh, I can mark off. I did this percentage of days of scripture reading this year. That's not important. When I'm trying, the devotion, the worship, the connecting with God is going to happen. And mm. all the little details stop mattering because they just follow. Does that make sense what I'm trying to yeah, say? Absolutely. So faith really is who we're being. And so I think when and, it comes to who we're being connected with. Yes, and who we're being connected with. And so, yes, the works are going to they're going to sort themselves out because right. I can't say that I'm being teacherly if I'm not doing teacherish sort of things. I can't right. say I'm being disciplely if I'm not doing disciplish sort of things, right? Right. Um, right. And in fact, your your works and your ability to do those works uh, it, it increase exponentially when you are being a disciple and you're connected to Christ yes. more than when you're focusing on doing the works themselves. Exactly. Right. It's it's not doing the works. It's the connection with Christ that makes the works good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good stuff. Very good. Good. And it, it really ties in with everything else we've been saying, this connection and sacrifice and, and so on. And ah, just beautiful stuff. Hmm. Well, I hope everyone keeps an eye out for Rebecca Call. You're going to see great things from Rebecca in the future and, and including hopefully a discussion about uh, Key Negado and uh Uh, just uh, all sorts of good things but uh, thank you Rebecca Uh, I feel a greater connection with both the scriptures and Christ after talking with you and I I hope everyone else does as well So, thank thank you you. and thank you for inviting me to be part of this my pleasure have have a great day for you and everyone else and and, uh, go and get connected to Christ